Hey guys, how's it going? So there's the session title. Make sure you guys are in the right place. My name is Chris Strahl. I work at Acquia. Uh, I'm a project manager um, turned program manager there, which is a fancy way of saying that I work with Acquia's big customers on their uh, the big things they want to do in Drupal. And mobile has become a relatively hot topic lately uh, inside of the, the Drupal enterprise space. And um, I first became pretty passionate about this topic in 2010 when I was at OSCON. And I heard Tim O'Reilly talking about uh, personal sensing technology. And at the time, um, I had a very close friend who was really into the idea of personal sensors. Uh, she was the first person I ever knew with a Fitbit. Um, and uh, since I was able to, to speak with her and get some feedback on this stuff and uh, hopefully be able to share some interesting knowledge about personal sensing with you guys. So uh, how many data points do you collect on a daily basis? You know, there, there are some things that uh, you might carry around that collect data for you. Uh, probably most everyone in here has a phone. Um, it's pretty popular also at conferences to take around a pedometer just because people like to brag about how many steps they take in between their sessions. Um, you know, you guys probably also have an iPad, some credit cards in the wallet. Uh, maybe you have a metro card or a subway card if you live in a big city. Um, all of you probably took airplanes or buses or taxis to get here today. Um, and you're probably a member of a social network or three uh, these days. Um, and then uh, you've probably used a mapping application uh, in you know, Google Maps or Bing or something like that from your cell phone or maybe from a desktop browser in the past week or so. Um, all of these things are capturing public data points about you. So all of your search histories, all of your social network interactions, all of this stuff is being captured and you're leaving little digital breadcrumbs around the internet um, about your particular browsing habits. Um, and it happens almost unconsciously now. We've gotten to the point where we don't necessarily even really think about um, the fact that every single action that we take online and with our devices that are in our pockets leaves a trace of something that we did. So lots of people think of this as mobile spying. Um, you know, there's a lot of very well-known capabilities that I think that people are, are generally cognizant of. Most people know their phone has a camera. Um, most people don't realize it never really turns off. Um, most people know that their, their cell phone has a microphone on it, which also doesn't ever really turn off. Um, most people know their phone has the internet, but they also don't really think about the fact that even when they're not actively using their phone, it's sending messages back and forth about what you're doing, your habits, lots of things about you. And then lastly, there's, there's GPS and other positioning systems within people's phones um, that are constantly collecting data about uh, where you are, if you're moving, if you're stationary. Uh, you know, it's pretty easy to, for a GPS to tell if you've just gone on an elevator because it'll have an elevation point for you at the beginning. It'll go dark for 30 seconds while you ride the elevator and then pick up your elevation point again at the end. Um, there are also some other not so well-known capabilities that, uh, that mobile devices have. So also on, on that cell phone of yours, you have an accelerometer. Um, an accelerometer works just like a pedometer. It's going to tell exactly how many steps you're taking. It's going to know things about your breathing habits, um, things about you, know, you when you're sleeping, all these other sorts of things that, that accelerometers combined with microphone technology can pick up and learn about us. Um, most of them have thermometers now. Um, there's not a ton of, of uh, mobile weather station stuff out there yet. Um, but that's one of the big ideas behind mobile devices is this idea that we would, uh, we would be able to have temperature information about you know, how warm or how cold we are or um, any sort of, of other um, weather-based information about the environment that we're in. Um, furthermore, you have a clock. It's pretty basic, but the clock is really key to all this because your phone is able to keep track of the length of time that you're doing certain things. Um, and that's very important for understanding uh, the action that you're taking at that, at that given moment. Um, and the, the compass aspect of it, and that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but one thing that has been coming up in, in mobile device land lately is the ability to monitor the power output of your phone. So at any given time, you have a bunch of different applications that are running on your phone. And I uh, was just reading an article on ReWriteWeb the other day about how uh, all of those mobile applications that we all use that are free to download, 
they're constantly sending data back and forth across the internet, and that's draining the batteries from our phones. Um, and you're actually able to profile uh, the power usage and power consumption on your phone and understand what mobile apps you're running. So any application that has access to monitor the battery life of your phone can also know all the other apps they're running on. So uh, the point of this is all, our, our phones know more about us than we think. Um, even the, the most technically savvy among us have probably heard one thing that was surprising in that tirade about um, mobile devices. But there's, there's more to it than that. There's also digital fingerprints that we leave in, in other ways. Uh, we have lots of application data about us. And all of us use mobile apps. Um, most of us use computers, iPads, that sort of thing. Um, those all, through their applications, are also collecting information about our habits. Uh, there's also things that we like to refer as proximal data. Um, proximal data is data of the people next to you. Um, it does not necessarily matter so much if you forgot your cell phone today, but if someone else notices that you're here and tags you or talks about you or checks you in or, you know, whatever else, what, name your, you know, Foursquare, Facebook-like application of choice, um, via proximal data, we can also understand a lot of about you. Usually proximal data is used to collaborate primary data, so data that you're presenting, but uh, oftentimes proximal data can be used in place of primary data. And then uh, lastly, you have environmental data. So there's, there's lots of environmental sensors. I, this talk's not really about these things, but it's important to know that every time you swipe your credit card, um, most of the time when you're in a taxi cab, uh, you get photographed or you leave little digital fi fingerprints around via your, your wallet and the transactions that happen in your wallet. So <laughs> this is all pretty cool, actually. I mean, we ended up with tricorders. I don't know how growing up as a little kid watching Star Trek with my dad when I was like 10, 11 years old that, uh, that uh, I saw Spock with that tricorder and I have one of those in my pocket. That is so cool. Um, the thing that I think that uh, we always thought about for mobile devices, we always thought about mobile devices delivering us information. We want to know more things about the world around us. But it's kind of flip-flopped. Um, these devices now, instead of telling us a lot of data, which they do do, um, they're actually used to gather a tremendous amount of information about us. And I'm not sure if we ever really thought about it that way in, until recently. And we can gain a lot of insights into human behavior. So one of the big shifts in that mentality has been from this idea of, of active participation versus passive participation. So when you're talking about actively sharing something, you're making a conscious effort to log on to Facebook and to type something in or to check in or any of those other things that require an action from you to actually do. But now there's a whole lot of passive communication that's happening. When all of us you know, download an app from uh, the, the iTunes store, you know, we, all, we all look at that license agreement for about a quarter of a second before we hit accept and we just gave away uh, all of our data that could be captured by that program. So once you opt in, you're constantly passively monitored until you opt out again. And the point of that is, is uh, it, now that there is, is data being collected about you, even when you're not consciously providing that data, it gives us a lot more information to work with. So one of the things that I don't want to dive too deeply into here, but it's definitely worth mentioning, is this is scary for a lot of people because people think about the idea of uh, privacy. Um, especially people that have uh, things in their private lives or controversial figures or whatnot that, that don't necessarily want those things to be public. Um, privacy is a huge concern and we have yet to solve it. Uh, there's a lot of bills going on in the European Union right now around uh, privacy and ownership of personal data. Uh, the United States is also considering similar things with the Obama administration. So there is a, there's a whole lot to do here. And this is kind of the, the bike shed of this talk, is I don't want to dive too deeply into privacy implications. I'm sure it will come up, and if any of you have questions about it, I understand at least a little bit about it. Um, but I really want to try to focus on, on something different. And, and what that is, um, is I want to look at uh, um, how this data can be used within society to collect information about all of us, not any one of us. So looking at some early adopters of this, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of uh, Hassan Alahi. Um, he uh, was targeted 
uh, by the United States government as a watchlist candidate not that long after uh, September 11th. Um, he had been traveling around the world and just got back to the United States and, and was detained by the FBI for, for some time. And uh, he is an artist. He travels around and does art installations. And uh, what Hassan found out is that um, you know, he was always in the system from this point on. And he was questioned on a weekly or a monthly basis about his activities. And so rather than wait for the FBI to come to him, he started going to the FBI. He got the card from, from one of his uh, agent handlers and said, you know what, I'm just going to let you know where I'm at. And uh, this turned into something over time. Uh, Hassan had been doing this for a couple of years where he would send, you know, oh, hey, I'm going to Senegal. And uh, by the way, here's a picture of, of me with, uh, you know, uh, a tiger or something like that. I don't know, a pony. Um, but he would start sending the FBI agents his vacation photos. And soon it became a lot more than that. They were sharing all sorts of personal anecdotes and all sorts of other things. And then his FBI handler left. And so it was back to that same routine of, you know, get called in every couple of weeks to go get questioned by the FBI. And so what he decided to do is he decided to turn into an art project. And he, um, he set up a website, which you can uh, view right there. And it's literally his entire life, where he is at every moment. I think it even has the phone calls he makes. Um, it's, it's literally everything about that guy in a timeline. And uh, over the years, he's amassed hundreds of thousands of photos, data points, Everything about his life is tracked on the internet. Um, another person that, that is kind of inspirational in this is a, a guy from Microsoft by the name of uh, Gordon Bell. And um, what Gordon Bell did, and this was actually largely controversial at the time, is uh, when he became an executive at Microsoft, he started carrying around a portable camera around his neck. And he took pictures of everyone he met with every day, uh, mundane objects like the food he eats, um, Every single thing, every time he interacts with a piece of technology, he's filming what he's doing. And he's amassed what is considered to be probably the largest online repository of computing and technology um, in existence. It's almost like a museum of technology through this guy's eyes over many, many years. Um, it's one of the most interesting projects to browse. I highly recommend, I know most of you don't like to type in a Microsoft.com domain, but uh, I highly recommend looking at that site because it's a really, really fascinating look at technology. So these guys were at the forefront of, of understanding what mobile sensing really meant. And while, like I said, I don't want to focus too much on individuals, I think that it's important to realize that these guys are, are pioneers in a way of understanding this whole idea of, of mobile interaction and personal sensing. So, this gets back to, to what the, the meat and potatoes of the talk is, if you will. Um, populations of people are always more interesting than individuals. Um, there, yes, there's privacy concerns associated with individuals. Yes, there's individual people that we can look to to try to understand this space. But really, it's about understanding us as people in a population. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different sizes of population you can talk about. But really, we want to look at insights into us as humans and to really understand our own behavior. So I'm going to show you guys some examples here in just a second. Um, so one of my favorite sayings is uh, a population, a statistical population, is not just a collection of anecdotal points. You have to define a population by a measurable group of people that have common characteristics. And that population data should then be able to be sliced and diced based on those characteristics. Um, Finally, the, the size of the population is not really relevant. I mean, you can have a population of this room. We're all at DrupalCon. We're all attending this session. So we can be considered a statistical population. And we could probably get some interesting stuff from us about our mobile sensors right now. Um, but it, it doesn't necessarily matter if we're talking about all, you know, however many billion people are on the planet or if we're just talking about the people here. So one of the most interesting ways of gathering a true population of uh, mobile sensing uh, devices is this project right here. It's uh, sponsored by Nokia. It's the Lasend data collection campaign. Um, what Nokia did is they said, well, it's, uh, it's um, really hard for us to get people to opt in to having their mobile devices monitored by us. 
Um, moreover, we don't really have an app to sell that provides a tremendous amount of value. So uh, we're just gonna give 200 people cell phones for free, for life. And the caveat of that is we have to be able to collect every bit of data about those people. And so it started in 2009, and um, they've been operating since then with these 200 individuals that live in Switzerland. And they're literally tracking everything about their habits at all time. And um, they've got in a tremendous amount of research published around the human behavior habits of all of these people. And they're not looking at any one individual. They're looking at the collective habits, how they interact with each other, how their friendships work, like what creates interest among people that will allow them to actually stop and talk to other people. And these phones are incredible because they have Bluetooth sensing technology, they have the internet, they have GPS, all the, the bells and whistles that smartphones have. But they also, whenever two people that are a part of the project come close to one another, they share data. And that really enables a really interesting thing because it, it creates not just this idea of Nokia watching over all of these people, but it creates this network of sharing between all these people so they can all learn about each other. And uh, one of the big research projects was, was understanding the relationships that they created via this project. And uh, uh, I really encourage you guys, I got a link to this up in the upper right corner, it's kind of hard to read. I encourage you guys to go look at the research that these guys have done because it's really brilliant and amazing stuff. So let's think about the size of this data for a second. Um, Zenga is you know, a popular casual gaming company that has like six of the top 10 Facebook games and you know, I'm sure everybody's at least seen Words with Friends if not played it themselves. Um, if you look at, at how many people use Zenga, 360 million people. And the vast majority of them, something like 80% of them, connect via their mobile devices. Um, at that rate, that is so much larger than all of those other things. Like, we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, way bigger than the entirety of Xbox Live, way bigger than all of World of Warcraft, way bigger than all of these things that we consider to be really big technology platforms. And because the power of casual gaming reaches out to us and provides us with this little bit of entertainment, we're willing to give Zenga everything about ourselves in order to play games. Um, furthermore, if you look at Facebook, uh, Facebook as of you know, December, I think, uh, claimed 845 million monthly users. And of those, uh, about 60% um, connected via a mobile application. That's not using your mobile device to go to facebook.com, that's actually using a Facebook mobile app. That is really tremendous that 60% of people are using Facebook via an app. So looking at the population there, you have hundreds if not thousands of data points that are collected about people that use those two applications. Um, and uh, they do it willingly and, and freely and almost without thought. Um, if any of you, I mean, I'm sure some of you guys use both Facebook and a Zenga game. Um, there are literally thousands of data points about you because of your use of those applications. Um, but what is really interesting is that you're able to cross-reference all of these between associates, so you know you play words with friends against other people. Um, you also have other sensors, so um, Facebook, for example, is able to tap into a lot of the hardware features of your phone around location, um, and, and non-personal sensors. So when you report that you're at DrupalCon, that is in and of itself a data point, even though it's not directly related to the device that you're working on. Um, and then there's also loads of information that is unrelated to that application that is collected. Uh, I know that, that my phone collects information about my music habits, and that is often shared on Facebook if I'm playing Spotify on my phone. So every Spotify song I listen to on my cell phone gets linked back to Facebook, and other people get to look at, at what I'm looking at. Um, all of those things are, again, these little digital breadcrumbs that we leave about our, our behavior and our habits. So, so seriously, uh, think about the amount of data that we're talking about here. We're talking about hundreds of millions of people collecting thousands of data points every month. That is a tremendous information repository, just in two applications, that is, could provide a, an incredible insight into our human lives and our behavior. Um, and again, not any one person's behavior, but think about the ability to track things like the spread of a disease, because people are posting about it on Facebook, uh, tracking political trends, tracking any of these other things that, that you could look at by looking at you know, a billion points of data about human beings. Um, 
And these are some of the types of questions that you could ask a data set like that. Um, where were people when they were playing Words with Friends? I mean, were they sitting on the toilet? Were they, uh, you know, riding a bicycle? That would be really hard. Hopefully they weren't driving. Um, you know, how long did they use them? What was the, the length of time that people interacted with these sorts of things? And what does that mean about our behavior? You know, are you, are you trying to close down Facebook real quick while you're at work because your boss might be looking over your shoulder? Um, and then what actions did you take? And, and that's really where the, the key is, is understanding the actions. Um, so I, again, just sort of reiterating what I just said. Uh, you're probably bored if you're playing Zenga. Um, or you're listening to me present at DrupalCon. Um, but anyway, the, the idea is, is that you're able to model um, pieces of human behavior based on our use of these applications. So this does a lot of interesting things. Uh, the implications for healthcare are huge. Um, if any of you have a, a Fitbit, uh, you guys can know relative to other people that have Fitbits what your exercise level is. Um, we could also, like I said, track the, the spread of contagions. Um, zombie outbreaks, for example. Um, there's a lot going on in the protest space about this. I mean, the protester was uh, a big topic this year, uh, or this past year, rather. And um, in uh, protests, you're seeing applications like Ushahidi and other uh, push-based data applications out there that are really aggregating a lot of information about um, protesters. And, and it's on both sides. Um, you also saw a lot of things with uh, uh, not necessarily protest related stuff, but natural disasters. The earthquake in Haiti is a great example of that. Um, because of our ability to collect information about mobile data, we, um, through Ushahidi, people were able to see um, which roads were open, where security centers were, where hospitals were still open, all based on the aggregation of this mobile data. And then other things where it could be interesting is, uh, I mentioned the mobile weather stations earlier, but uh, the cartel project from MIT is all about collecting information about the speed at which you're traveling based on the GPS in your cell phone. And if you're in your car, it'll know you're in your car, and it'll be able to figure out where traffic is blocked. Um, and you know, any of you that, uh, that have been in Boston and driven you know, any of the highways in, in the middle of town can understand why the folks at MIT would be interested in something like that. Um, Acqui is based in Boston, and it sometimes takes you know, 40 minutes to get to, to the office from downtown. Um, so those sorts of things allow us to have an unprecedented window into all the different facets of our lives that could benefit from understanding more about how other people are experiencing the same thing. So here's a few projects I wanted to point you guys to. Um, I mentioned the LDCC earlier on a previous slide, but there it is again. Uh, the Open Geocoder project is really fascinating. It's a, a mobile device app for mapping where it takes map points um, and tracks your, your GPS coordinates and provides sort of a quasi open layer like overlay where you can uh, uh, present, hey, I, I want to know, um, for example, I live in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I want to know that I'm walking around in the Pearl neighborhood in Portland, Oregon. And so that open, uh, open geocoder allows you to say, I'm in um, Portland, I know that, by my GPS coordinates, other people have tagged where I am standing as the Pearl, so I am actually in the Pearl. Um, Open Sense, which is a, a interesting project, um, not to be confused with HTC's opening of their Sense UI. That's different. Um, Open Sense is all about uh, again a mapping application around personal data and sensor data. It's probably the most developed API I've seen around um, being able to collect sensor information. So any of you that are more into the development side of things. Um, I really encourage checking that out. There are actually some companies that are starting to do some really interesting things based on the open sense ideas. Um, and then I mentioned Cartel, with the, the folks at MIT monitoring uh, traffic patterns. So uh, eventually this owl has to come back to Drupal, right? Um, we are at DrupalCon, and uh, as much as I love to sit and talk about mobile sensing technology, there is really a point to all of this. Um, you know, the important thing in Drupal is, is Drupal is really known well for its data model. And there should be ways for us to look at this mobile sensing information and be able to aggregate that data and store it in Drupal. Um, maybe not to the multi-hundred billion um, data point model, but being able to store um, aggregate data that has been pre-mined or pre-filtered and then visualize that data. 
So Drupal on the, the end of this can work in mobile applications as that content store, as the collection of the mobile data, and as the visualization of that data. And that's a really powerful combination. And I think that there is a lot of interesting stuff to be done in Drupal around these projects. And um, you can see one of them there, um, maps.ed.gov, has a broadband penetration map that is a visualization of broadband data. Now, they don't store their data in Drupal. The map is pre-rendered. Um, except you can still browse it and see it in a way that is really interesting using Drupal. So those are some ways that we as a community can look at how we can interact with this, this new idea of mobile sensing technology and hopefully jump on top of it and do some really interesting things. So that's it. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to, to take them. They said to go up to the microphone if, uh, if you had a question or if you are too shy, you can shout it at me and I'll repeat it for you. So the question is, let me see if this works. Um, in the ideas of responsive design, um, we want to be able to create better UX via responsive design for mobile devices. Is there any way to tap into personal sensing technology to enable that to happen? Is that a fair statement? Um, so the idea behind responsive design, we don't get to know a lot in the web app space yet about devices, but it's coming. I mean, right now, we get sometimes things like orientation so a website will change when you turn an iPad sideways. Um, we get geolocated data often. Um, but there's not really you know, access to the thermometer or something like that on your, on your cell phone. Um, I think that HTML5 is enabling a lot of that to start to happen, where we're, we're figuring out how to get at the sensing portion of the device easier. And um, in terms of the responsive design idea, I think that it, it especially related to aggregate populations, it would be interesting to be able to do um, ad hoc uh, mobile usability testing over a population of people. So you have a, a, a mobile website that is out there, and via some sort of data collection system on a sensor, you're able to see how people are using that site, when they're using that site, um, and, and understand when people want to visit your site, and how they're using it when they're there on a mobile device, and what's working and what isn't. I think that's where this is really enabling that sort of thing. Um, I mean, the responsive idea has a lot, and I, I'm not really as versed on um, how that might interact with sensing technology other than some of the stuff we get in HTML5 right now. Um, for like um, all these data points, is there anyone that's um, really processing the, this vast amount of information? Like, like on a broad scale, like say the entire Verizon network or something like that? Well, Verizon is probably doing it. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, one of, the, one of the good ones that I, I should have mentioned but I didn't, um, Twitter is archiving all of its tweets in, in the National Archive. And so uh, that right there is a vast amount of people's public opinion. And I mean, it's probably a lot of like snooky references and cat pictures. But at the same time, like there's probably valuable things about election data and about um, you know, Arab Spring, how a lot of that happened on Twitter, a lot of the organization of that. And so that data is out there, and the US government is using it through a lot of open data projects. And then moreover, Twitter is using it to, to continue to um, have a basis of understanding of public opinion. You also see a lot of, of things in like the ratings folks, um, the, the people that do uh, like the Nielsen ratings and, and all that sort of stuff, where um, you know, you'll look at, at uh, policy perceptions. So a lot of perception sensing across these big amounts of data. But a lot of it is really holed up right now in an individual company. And um, a, a lot of it is like, you know, the guys that own the apps, right? So Zenga probably has a tremendous amount of data about everybody that plays Words with Friends. Um, or Scrabble, or what's the Scramble? Yeah, Scramble's the new one. Or, um, and then uh, you also have places like Google 
where Google has a tremendous amount of data housed within it, and it allows us to window into some of it, but not all of it, because they see that data as, as their leverage and, and what they're selling. All right, cool. Uh, great presentation, thank you. Thanks. Uh, for Drupal today, what is the best tools to start aggregating and capturing this data on our sites right now? So, um, again, I mentioned HTML5 and the ability to, to capture, especially like geolocated data. A lot of it has to do with integrations. So, using things like services and feeds and pulling in data from other areas. And then, um, like I said, I mean, Drupal can scale pretty well, but having billions of data points is, is pretty tough to just all fit in anything more than a table. Um, and so, I think that, that where Drupal is going to really shine is if you're able to have some sort of of mobile data um, aggregation service, and then pulling that aggregated data into visualizations, that's where it becomes really interesting for Drupal, right? Mm -hmm. Because now all of a sudden I can see traffic patterns from the cartel system overlaid on a local map. Um, and I, I know that that's kind of been done, but um, there are a lot of interesting things, especially in, in the, the disaster recovery and relief space. Uh, Restore the Gulf is a great example of that where they're using a lot of open layer stuff to, um, to visualize uh, uh, the impact of the whole deep water horizon thing. So that's where Drupal really shines right now, is not necessarily in the, the collection of that data, but really in the aggregation and visualization of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess this is sort of along the same lines of like implementation, like with Drupal's backend being uh, by default, MySQL, do you think they'll need to switch that out for another database system to take full advantage, or are you just using this as purely visualization? Well, you can do that. So, I mean, we have the ability to have a different database in the back end of Drupal. Um, and so, you know, you might store your visual visualizations in Mongo because you don't want to build the visualization every time. You might want to have, uh, I don't know, let's use another dirty word, Oracle. Um, as the, the main store for all of these data points um, and then interface with that. Um, I mean, all of those things are, are capable in Drupal, which is, is great. And, you know, again, that speaks to the integration side of things too, right? I mean, if, if we ever really need to have that massive data capture somewhere, it's very easy to integrate Drupal into that data system and, and use the, the tools available to us to collect that data and then visualize it. Yeah, there's, there, uh, so the question was about the, the Nokia-funded research project in, uh, in Switzerland. And uh, a gentleman was asking if um, there's any known effects to their behavior based upon the research that's being, being performed with that population. Uh, yes, absolutely there is. It's one of the things that they tout as an interesting result of the project, that um, people's ability to identify others that are in this same program has actually led to more interconnectedness between members than would have existed normally. Um, and it, it goes on to explain a lot about that in, in a lot of very in-depth, researchy, organizational behavior-y sort of ways. Um, but uh, the interesting part is the ability for people to connect better between themselves and to understand more about common and shared interests the research is there on the site. You can actually read the paper. Um, it's really good, really fascinating. Anybody else? That's actually rather than just sort of stopping and saying, okay, well, we've collected this, the algorithms have been run, and this is the truth, this is what this is about, um, where you actually can actually incorporate other people's sort of interpretations. That's a, a fascinating question, actually. So the, so the question is, um, you know, what about the idea of, of um, using Drupal to facilitate um, 
an understanding of the data that we're collecting and um, trying to, to build tools that more than just visualization collect perception of um, the data itself. And I think that that is a really interesting space for Drupal. Um, because we have great community features, because we have collaborative environment, because we are an open source project and we're built by a lot of different people, um, understanding perceptions and attitudes like that, um, I, I think that that would be a really interesting way to explore how we could do this in Drupal and how we could really make something interesting. So you, you talked a lot about the sensors and the data that you collect from cell phones, but I just wanted to mention something that I had actually been involved in a little bit, which is other kinds of sensor, mobile sensor uh, collection through devices that you actually want to carry specifically for that purpose. So the Fitbit's kind of like that, but more on the open source um, side of the ecology. There's a website called PacTube, P-A-C-H-T-U-B-E, uh, and it's designed for the collection of sensor data from any kind of device that you can attach to the web, basically. So a lot of people are using small hardware devices like Arduinos and things like that, and sensors in their gardens, on their rooftops, and, and that they carry around with them or put in cars, uh, and building sort of virtual networks of people collecting similar kinds of information and then displaying it through PacTube, which is also an open source project. So something else to look into. So with PacTube, wasn't that the, the one where the grant proposal went out to do mobile weather stations? Yeah. And it was, yeah, that, it was with the U.S. government where we were talking about aggregate collection of, of mobile weather information based on individuals? That was the genesis of the project, and it's since expanded to basically collecting any kind of sensor information about anything. And you can sort of generate your own PacTube profile and then say, I'm going to be collecting data about soil moisture and temperature in the Pacific Northwest or something. Yeah, yeah um, so I went to Washington State University where um, we care a lot about farmland because that's all that's really there. Um, and so we had a lot of this, this pack tube stuff with uh, uh, soil moisture and rainfall um, because the water table in Pullman is really, really high and we have a lot of artesian wells and stuff like that. And people wanted to be able to forecast um, like crop planting and stuff based on soil moisture. And it was all this whole mobile sensor idea, not related to a person, but you'd weatherize one of those things and stick it out in a field. One of the, one of the things that I like most about that model of doing it is that the data that they collect is open. So if you wanted to build a Drupal site to do analysis and aggregation of a specific sort of topic, you could go out and find other people who were storing uh, data points on PacTube and bring that data into a Drupal site for analysis or, uh, or representation somehow. So. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. That's a great point. Anyone else? Thanks a lot for listening to me, guys. Appreciate it.